Thank you very much for coming to us. It's great to be accompanied by now <laughs> that speaks. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, as Douglas said, I'm going to be talking about uh, Mary Mitchell and Plotinus, and the title of this talk is Self and Not Self, which Douglas liked very much, and I had to admit it's not my own. It's in fact a title that Mary Mitchley uh, herself thought about. Um, so Mary Mitchley was a British philosopher who taught at Newcastle University and elsewhere in the UK. And she published extensively, and I'm going to show you some of her books now. Uh, I don't know exactly. Okay, so that's, that's her. Um, she was born in 1919 and uh, passed away in 2018. And these are some of her books. Um, the Owl of Minerva is the first book that I've read of hers, but it isn't her first book. Her first book is... Um, is it Beast and Man? And the last book that she wrote um, when she was 99 years old was What is Philosophy for? The other big book there. Um, so, as you can see here, there is nothing that directly relates to Plotinus, Neoplatonism, or even ancient philosophy. However, um, she started in 1947 a PhD on Plotinus, a doctorate on Plotinus in Oxford a PhD that she never actually completed. And what is even more interesting, as I said, is that, okay, she didn't complete the doctorate, but there isn't any of these books that um, actually talks about her work on, on Plotinus at all. So just before her passing in 2018, she sent me through um, Rachel Wiseman, who is a colleague of mine, a mutual friend, a box uh, that contained all of her work on Plotinus, uh, a series of draft essays and brief comments on extracts from the Aeneids. And in approaching, of course, this material, which was kind of a, a gift, and it was a wonderful, wonderful surprise that she had uh, kept everything, you know. Um, I have benefited from conversations with her son, David Mitchley, um, well, here is the editor of The Essential Mary Midgley and several recent publications such as Rachel Wiseman's and Claire McCall's um, book, Metaphysical Animals on Midgley and the circle of her friends, which included um, Iris Murdoch and Philippa Foote and um, Elizabeth Anscombe. And because of that book and several other books in recent years, these four philosophers, women philosophers, uh, have been brought to the uh, foreground of current philosophical discourse, as it were. In studying Midgley's writing on Plotinus, as well as her whole corpus, I have had primarily two questions in mind. The first is, are there any links between Midgley's background in Plotinus and her subsequent work? And secondly, what are the philosophical merits of Midgley's interpretation of Plotinus? So I will start by offering some brief um, sort of preliminary responses to the first question. And then I will proceed to the examination of the second question with uh, reference to four extended essays. Um, here are the essays, the only sort of four essays, as it were, that were contained in the book. And the first was called Self and Not Self, which was her intended title for the whole thesis. The second is called Consciousness and Personality Plotinus. The third discusses individuation, and the fourth discusses perception. So this is what I will be sort of looking at um, with reference to um, the, my second question. But after reconstructing, so to speak, and assessing the significance of the main aspects of Midgley's interpretation of Plotinus through these essays on the views of the self and not self, I shall return to the first question, I examine the links between Plotinus and Midgley's philosophy in some more detail. So, as a doctoral student, Mary Midgley, then Mary Scruton, was supervised by E.R. Dodds, um, who was professor of Greek at the University of Oxford. And as she notes in the Isle of Minerva, which is an autobiographical book, um, he was most impressive 
as a professor, but at the same time, shy and very distant. Um, but he was keen to get attention um, given to other parts of Greek thought besides the uh, sort of mainstream um, thinkers like Plato and Aristotle. Initially, Midgley was inclined herself to study Plato, but in the end, influenced by Dodds, she chose to work on Plotinus because the Aeneids um, and Neoplatonism more generally were unexplored territory at the time, original and challenging. And she's made some remarks about Plotinus. She said she liked him. Um, she liked the look of him, but uh, um, it was too much and she never completed her thesis. And so um, as she mentions in an article in The Guardian, Plotinus's views on the soul, the topic of her thesis, was so unfashionable and so vast that she never completed it. And it was, of course, the complexity of the subject, which required knowledge and understanding, as she says, of the whole of philosophy before Plotinus, which is quite substantial. And the grind of more or less grammatical and philosophical kind involved. And her um, rather limited knowledge of Greek and anyone familiar with Plotinus, um, I think knows that uh, his Greek is quite challenging. Um, so some of these some of these were the obstacles that sort of she encountered and led to um, her not completing. But it, at an interview in 2013 with uh, Simon Jenkins, he said there are a lot of wasted opportunities in my past, and I think that's one of them. So my question is, was it a missed opportunity? Now, first of all, that she did not complete her thesis didn't really seem to bother her at all. And in fact, in, a, in, a, in an article that she wrote for, for the Guardian called the, uh, called the Proud Not to Be a Doctor, she says, I ended up unqualified and grateful for it. As she explains therein, PhD training is useful insofar as it provides one the indispensable skills of a lawyer but that close work, that close work doesn't help you to grasp the big questions. Philosophers of the past, she continues, were not just lawyers, they were volcanic phenomena, eccentric thinkers who located new problems and grappled with the issues of their age. And indeed, anyone who's read Midgley will know for sure that her approach, her philosophy is anything but sort of myopic, anything but that kind of uh, philosophy that she criticizes. But was her engagement with Plotinus just an insignificant, philosophically insignificant in between? The question is really whether that study, albeit incomplete, has a place within the development of her remarkable and varied philosophical work. And at first sight, it seems that it doesn't. Plotinus is rarely mentioned in her writings. And I have been able to identify just two references, both in passing, one in her book, Wickedness, published in 1984, and the other one in a collection of essays called Science and Poetry, published in 2001, which is actually just an indirect reference to Plotinus. So I really doubt that she ever read the Aeneids again, which is rather interesting given that she thought so highly of Plotinus. So she said, I think he's a great philosopher and she's written in the Isle of Minerva, a shrewd and serious philosopher who uh, was indeed dealing with the questions that interested me. So these questions, these problems, she seem have to preceded her engagement with Plotinus. And I believe, although amplified by many more, continued to persist throughout her work. But what of her study of Plotinus and the way he dealt with these questions, most notably the inquiry into the self, which her thesis aimed at exploring. So Midgley acknowledges that for that the philosophical inquiry into the self has an ontological dimension. And as it was the case with the ancient Greek tradition from pre-Socratic to Hellenistic philosophy, it can be undertaken uh, as part of a general inquiry about reality. Moreover, it has been particularly recognized in modern philosophy uh, that such an inquiry uh, can be explicitly motivated by epistemological interests. 
However, Midgley attributes to Plotinus's concern for the self a motivation that combines ontology, metaphysics, and uh, epistemology, but is primarily practical. Plotinus is, of course, well known for claiming that um, action is for the sake of contemplation. And um, so men of action um, also aim at contemplation. So this practical motivation that um, you know, Midgley attributes to Plotinus uh, cannot refer primarily to social or political projects, but is rather a soteriological motivation. It's about salvation. So as Midgley puts it, Plotinus's inquiry takes place in a period when instead of forming part of a Catholic curiosity about the external world, the self became linked with that of God and the stars as a means of escaping from it, so that the turn inward is undertaken in service of salvation. However, given Plotinus's well-known polemic against the Gnostics, this formulation is also somewhat misleading. So Midgley accordingly qualifies it by claiming that his essential aim is to justify this kind of moral view, which admits as a motive the vision of a better self that one might become by making this vision a genuine cognition and the ideal true self thus known more real than the conscious self of everyday experience. The point being, that one looks inward in order to engage in some sort of self-creation. The inquiry into the self aims at a form of knowledge that is um, crucial for a project of self transformation So for Midgley, the originality and significance of Plotinus's project lies in the radical reconceptualization of the traditional understanding of the relationship between the self and the world. Broadly, the Greek tradition expressed this relationship in terms of an opposition between two independent structures, the microcosm and the macrocosm. And these were related uh, by sharing or mirroring similar patterns of intelligence. This is the similarity that Brown say the epistemological principle that the like knows the like, or the city-soul analogy in the Republic, or um, the role of forms in Aristotle's account of perception. But against this background, Plotinus's innovation is that in his system, the macrocosm has been almost wholly absorbed into the microcosm. All that has the same structure and substance as the self has been made in some sense part of the self. So the microcosm, i.e. the self, absorbs almost everything that lies outside it, the natural world, society, and the divine. And so in a sense, abolishes the distinction between the internal and the external, or the existence of two independent structures of the subject and the object. So this, the limits of this process of absorption are actually the limits of intelligibility which in Midgley's understanding of Plotinus are coextensive with the limits of value. So what is contained within the structure, like within the self, is everything that is intelligible, has meaning or value. And this includes both the intelligible realm of ideas and the sensible domain of natural or artificial entities and objects. What is left outside at the outer opposite extremes of this structure, the not self, is what is strictly speaking meaningless, namely the one and matter, or else what is either invaluable or valueless. What Plotinus does leave out is really objective, she says, and not self, because the self has really no element in common with it to understand it. Ultimately, the world can only be known as a complex self, an indwelling world, the old conception that like could only be perceived by the like reaches with Plotinus its logical conclusion that actually nobody can perceive anything but oneself. This absorption of the object necessarily expands and complicates, of course, the subject. So 
The world within, that we now have, includes all aspects of apparently external reality that are accessible to human beings, both in their ordinary cognitive or practical dealings with the world and through philosophical contemplation and reflection. However, it would be misleading to interpret this process of absorption of external reality as an attempt to neutralize in this way the typical philosophical conflicts or tensions or antinomies or paradoxes that are usually expressed through an opposition between internal and external, for example, matter versus body or um, sort of eternal versus temporal existence or freedom versus causality and so on. So in Plotinus, these conflicts do not disappear, but are re-established in some relevant sense inside the subject. And Mitchley writes, conflicts which had been taken as arising between the individual and the outer world are seen as raging between inner and outer aspects of the same individual. So before, so we can look at, um, some sort of detail, this conflict in some detail. And to do so, we need to make a couple of notes about Plotinus. Um, so Plotinus's conception of the self rests on the re-evaluation of the function of the soul within his philosophical system. So from a hypostatic ontological point of view, soul plays a crucially double role the soul is amphibious, which constitutes one of the most fundamental paradoxes associated with his account of the self. On the one hand, Plotinus thinks of the soul as the in-between, a border or a membrane that separates and brings together the intelligible and sensible realms. Ensuring, however, that nothing is far away from anything else. And this is done because it allows a thorough diffusion of meaning, sort of acts as an interpreter. On the other hand, the internal distance or extension of the Plotinian self is nothing but soul's extension during or after its embodiment from an upper part, which remains in the intelligible uh, domain, to a middle and then a lower part that comes into contact with the body. As Anna says, we are all, all of us, each one of us, an intelligible universe. The soul is thus paradoxically this thin membrane that nevertheless extends and it extends in a way that can absorb the entire external reality. And in that sense, um, a distance, is, it is a distance, it marks a distance that is both real and illusory. At the same time now, that middle part functions, so to speak, as the individual's point, point of entry to the complex structure of the self. So this middle is the curious status of ordinary consciousness, which can wander to the levels above and below that which it normally inhabits or else it is a place where a choice or many choices actually can be made about whether one goes up or looks up or down. So in this sense, the Plotinian self is not a unitary self, but it's rather a hierarchy of selves, a continuum marked by a graduate scale whose divisions, though much stressed in the interest of the dignity of the upper parts are often obscured and hardly consistent, Mitchell says. Given the existence of this continuum from an external or ontological point of view, the unity of the soul would have to be grounded on the hierarchical arrangement of the elements, which makes the being of each, of each only explicable in relation to its place within that system. While from an internal or phenomenological point of view, it would have to be attributed to the particular status of consciousness, which can wander to the levels um, above and below um, that which it normally inhabits. So in both these respects, we meet here another fundamental tension in Plotinus' account of the self, 
these divisions must be rigid enough to ensure the reality of the distinctions between the elements of the hierarchy, but they also need to be fluid enough to allow for the possibility of ascending and descending in a way that really transforms the entity that goes through this, this process. So how are we then to justify the existence of such complexity that generates all these paradoxical antinomies and tensions? One option is to think that that's like where Plotinus fails as a philosopher, um, that he delivered something that is so co complex that cannot be justified. To assess that, you know, that might be true, but we would also need to account that's the challenge for the unity sort of of that structure. If we are many, but at the same we're supposed to be all and one, how can we specify that unity um, that we can attribute to Plotinus' uh, structure of the self? How, how can we talk about the self? Can we properly speak about a self or the self as a unified entity composed substantially of distinct parts and so such conflicting parts? Or is it, as Arnoux put it, just a colony of beings? That's, that's what that self is, a collection of forms and differences superimposed upon each other. Now, Mitchley, confronted with these questions, that's the quotation from Arnoux that he like uh, Douglas. So, confronted with these questions that are raised, Midgley claims that she does not know a better way of illustrating the difference between the complex and paradoxical Platinian self and the more traditionally unified self than from two pictures. And he writes these pictures. So she says, in the Villa Borghese in Rome, um, hang side by side pictures of the adoration of the shepherds by Bassano and by his pupil, El Greco. Actually, I don't know whether it is true. I, I tried to find an instance where these, these paintings uh, uh, were hung side by side, I couldn't. So maybe she just imagined that. And also there are various versions of these paintings, and, but I, I hope these are, kind of illustrative enough to see, to see the point here. So she continues, the human figures in both are composed very similarly. And in the Bassano picture, they are the whole story. They are self-contained and placid, set in a rather flattened rectangle and centering unambiguously on the virgin and the child. But in the Greco, the heavens have opened above them, shooting, um, up to an apparition for, of angels at the top. A great but uncertain gap separates divine and human affairs. Light runs to and fro, gravity seems suspended and the dazzled figures rise and sway, tense, ecstatic, transitory in the wind and strain of a new revelation. The elongation and sense of dis destruction are not simply a minor trick to astonish you, they are the expression of the real destruction of a spirit between two worlds, uncertain of its loyalties, deprived of a single center of gravitation. Basically, reads in these two paintings the vivid contrast between a conception of the self as a strongly unified structure with a single focus, no gaps, and all its elements present in an imminent way and the conception of the self as a dynamic structure with internal gaps, fuzzy elements, and neither sharp focus nor clear closure. So from say a Christian metaphysical point of view, El Greco's painting is more complete since it brings together on the same surface, the earthly and the heavenly realms and offers an artistic representation of both their hierarchical ordering and the dynamic possibilities of their complex interaction. However, if we consider the painting to be a model for the self, the full internalization of reality turns the self into an open structure that has neither clear boundaries nor a well-defined uh, well essential functions. So in becoming self-sufficient, 
this self seems to lose its essential closure. Passage painter is earlier chronologically than um, the Agrecos. And also kind of, we can say that it belongs as the product of the high Renaissance. The latter, this the Greco painting belongs to the incipient Baroque. However, from a philosophical sort of point of view as an image of the self, Bassano's painting is decidedly more modern since it clearly points to the conception of the subject developed by early modern philosophers be it uh, rationalists or empiricists. So we have a sovereign, naturalized, imminent subject and burdened by the traditional or scholastic metaphysical trappings and props. Mitchell is clearly aware of this development and she quotes a comment um, by William Inch on Kant's Copernical Revolution, which suggests this connection. So she says, um, in modern idealism, the soul or um, self-conscious tends to be the fixed center around which all revolves. In Plotinus, it is the wanderer of the metaphysical world. That is why, as she puts it, the 20th century in a similar predicament finds help in a more, the more serious depictors of that Baroque universe rather than in the high Renaissance and in the outlying ages of Greece, rather than in the full sun of the fifth century. Now, given these comments, Mitchley's view is that the complexity of the Plotinian self, which generates all these paradoxes and conflicts, is not Plotinus's philosophical shortcoming, leading him to inconsistencies, as Arnoux had suggested, but rather, it is the direct product of his exploring the inconsistency of human nature. In this sense, all these paradoxes for Midgley are legitimate philosophically, philosophical paradoxes, both in the sense that they capture antinomic tensions of reality that one can be identified and um, yeah, that can be identified and expressed prior to any systematic philosophical elaboration but also in the sense that they prepare the way for the articulation of a philosophical theory that can explicate them, qualify them, resolve them, in other words. But what exactly is the inconsistency of human nature that uh, pushes Plotinus to the limits and, and, and us as well? First, Midgley claims that the Plotinian self does not have an essence in the Aristotelian sense i.e. that the range of existing possibilities for the development of the human self cannot be captured by appealing to a natural process of interaction between form and matter, as we may do for the biological uh, development of, as he says, cats and trees. As we have seen, Plotinus recognizes both the existence of a true or real self and the possibility of becoming this real self after acquiring a contemplative vision of it. However, and this is Midgley's main point, this process of transformation is radically different from the process through which an acorn becomes an oak tree. And this is because the variations of the outcome are too great to suggest mere causal deviations from a known norm. It's also because this process is punctuated by points of substantive conflict uh, between um, rival norms and rival standards of different ways of life. And also it's because it is crucial for this process that the outcome of these occasions of conflict is conceptualized in terms of the freedom of the self to choose to become this or that. So it is precisely this strong sense of conflicting possibilities, which is one aspect of the sense of freedom that demands a more complicated Itself. So let me make uh, two points uh, here. The first concerns the nature of the unity of the self that Midgley could hope to establish, assuming her interpretation of course of Plotinus stands. 
So after discussing the problem that Ardu raised in much more detail, of course, um, she concludes that the charge that Plotinus's division of the self is so rigid is to be met by suggesting that it is meant as a map, as a set of marks on a scale of change, not as a catalog of separate objects. So it is only upon reaching one's destination, as it were, by undergoing this kind of transformative change that one can decide whether this map, any map, has been helpful in unifying, so to speak, the journey, the distance uh, between the beginning, from the beginning to, to the end. The second point I wish to make uh, concerns the appeal of um, Mitchell's interpretation of Plotinus uh, for us, perhaps. So despite the various ways in which um, this conception has been undermined, especially during the 20th century, perhaps most of us still think of human reality, of reality as experienced by human beings in what we may call the Cartesian Hobbesian terms. So each one of us is a separate individual, secure within the internal domain of ourselves. We have to negotiate the blessings and more urgently the curses of external reality as shaped by the interactions we have uh, with multiple individuals. In this way, for every action and event, say when individuals come to conflict with their neighbor, when they destroy their physical environment, when a disease befalls them, or when they fail to achieve their aims because of some existing social obstruction, there is always a clear way to separate what is internal and what is external to the self in an appropriate way. So I say my happiness versus your happiness, my choice versus the external conditions that maybe do what made, made, made me do otherwise. But Plotinus' understanding of the self as reconstructed by Nietzsche is entirely at odds with this kind of picture. So if we go for it, um, it would mean that the drama which has been supposed to be going on in the world can be played out within the self. All the actors are present and present in a manner which makes their meeting possible. This is of course paradoxical and clearly, uh, but clearly echoes many similar Protinian uh, claims um, that I think are put there. I'll read a few. When we look outside that on which we depend, we do not know that we are one, like faces which are many on the outside, but have one head inside. For the soul is many and all things, both what is above and what is uh, below. Etc. So obviously Plotinus does not mean that we are omniscient and omnipotent, he didn't go that far, that we are aware of and causally or morally responsible for everything that happens in the universe. And as we saw, the world within is far from the haven of the Cartesian subject, but is essentially characterized by conflict and opposition. So the obvious question, why would someone accept Plotinus's invitation to redraw in this way the boundaries between the self and the world? So in the remainder of the last part of this paper, I will attempt to show why Midgley did so, why she accepted that invitation. So in 2015, three years before her death, when she was 96, she was interviewed by Paul Merchant for the British Library Science and Religion Life Story interview series. And during this nine part interview, which uh, took place over four months, Merchant asked Midgley explicitly how her work on Plotinus influenced her subsequent philosophical development. She responded that she absorbed the Plotinian idea that everything is really all one which pervaded her thinking on many different subjects. Even if one doesn't always see the connections, she noted, one should always try to establish them. And she considered her own philosophical work as an attempt to do just that, to bring different things together, and in so doing, to try and hopefully resolve the conflict between them. 
The human self, which has been the focus of my talk today, remained at the core of her philosophical interest and her approach, much like Plotinus's in her view, aims at an articulation that would take into account ontological, epistemological and practical aspects while being constantly preoccupied with the distinction between the self and not self, the internal and external, and the conflicts that arise when one tries to make a very sharp and rigid distinction between the two, as is the case with modern philosophers such as Descartes and Hobbes. For example, in the introduction to her book, The Ethical Primate, uh, published in 1994, she identifies the conflict between the domain of morality or freedom versus the domain of our animal nature as present throughout the philosophical tradition from Plato to Kant. Her claim is that this book is her attempt to make the process a little easier, to bridge the gap that splits our idea of our own nature so that we can move towards a more integrated understanding notion of ourselves. So this reconciliatory attempt is not limited to this book, but according to Midgley, it is a primary aim also for her first book, Beast and Man, published in 1979, which is directly concerned with the issue of human nature and other books such as Heart and Mind, 1981, and Wickedness, 1984, in which she articulates her views on morality and its presuppositions. In Beast and Man, she presents this issue as a debate between two broad opposing positions. On the one hand, there are those who believe that there is a human nature, which may be determined by our animal nature, as in ethology, or it may be determined by instincts, as in psychoanalysis, or by social economic motivations, as in Marxism. On the other hand, there are the others, those who, for a variety of reasons, find the notion of human nature false dangerous or epistemically superfluous. This would be a very diverse group, but it will include, among others, existentialists who want to safeguard human freedom and responsibility, and of course, strict behaviorists who want to safeguard human freedom, um, sorry, who want to um, understand human beings on the basis of their observable uh, behavior and alone. So Midgley discusses these various forms, um, these opposing sort of views, examining some of their concrete strengths and of course some of their weaknesses. And her overall conclusion is essentially two claims. One claim is in defense of complexity, and the other one is a defense of a reconciliation, reconciliation between these two opposing viewpoints. The claim for complexity is expressed most clearly in the context of the discussion of various attempts, whether philosophical, as in Hobbes, for instance, or Nietzsche, or psychological, as Freud's attempts were, to offer a conception of human nature on the basis of a small set of dominant human motivations. As Midgley puts it, these intellectual systems that have tried to organize um, our common sense experience of human nature or motivations work mostly by reducing many motives to one or a few basic ones like sex, self-preservation and power. They tidy one province, he says, but then they distort themselves in an effort to take over the whole human life simply contains more motives, even more separate groups of motives than these approaches allow. Now, the claim in defense of reconciliation is expressed directly in terms of the nature-nurture debate. We have to move beyond the very strong impression still prevalent that we have to choose between considering these internal tendencies and considering outside conditions that we must be either loyal innatists or faithful environmentalists. This polarization, she says, seems much like holding that the quality of food is determined either 
by what it is like when you buy it or by how you cook, cook it and not both. Now, in the context of uh, beast and man, the defense of complexity and of reconciliation refer directly to projects for describing or understanding human nature. We should think of ourselves being partly determined by animal, our animal nature, but partly not. We should think of our actions as partly determined by a set of uh, motives or instincts, but this set is not easily or really definable. We should think of our patterns of behavior in our life as determined partly uh, by our internal motivations and partly by external um, situations. However, in other works, Midgley makes similar claims with regard to conflicts and debates between our theoretical understandings uh, of ourselves and our practical um, interests. So in The Ethical Primate and The Solitary Self, um, she presents us with attempts to reconcile our conception of ourselves as selfish animals or individuals. And once more, any progress in resolving these conflicts requires, according to her, both that we recognize more fully how complex our motives are, and especially what kind of inner conflicts this complexity involves, both in our own and in other species. And that we manage to steer clear between the two opposite theoretical tempting alternatives, i.e. that of a strict dualism, that will reinforce and preserve the gaps in our self-understanding and that of, a, on the other side, an impatient reductionism motivated uh, precisely by our failure to take seriously the complexity of ourselves. So if taken together now, these two claims um, in defense of complexity and of reconciliation, of softening dualistic distinctions and avoiding monistic reductions, lead naturally to a holistic conception of reality, that's what she aims for, in which the individuality of the parts is equally recognized as their um, interdependence within the whole. So Midgley herself, and you may be sort of familiar with this idea, moved uh, in this direction by invoking and developing uh, the notion of a guy and thinking most strikingly, uh, striking succinctly in uh, her essay, Individualism and the, concept, the Concept of Gaia. And her starting point there is of thinking of this hypothesis, this idea of Gaia, of life on Earth as a self-sustained natural system, of an ecological system in which non-living and living natural objects exist as relatively separate parts, but crucially uh, affecting the whole and are being affected by the whole. Now, Midgley presents this idea as an imaginative vision, a comprehensive world picture of the kind that is necessary for our overall orientation in the world. She further claims that this vision is fully compatible with our scientific understanding of the world. And it is as much, um, it is actually much more realistic than the alternative word picture of the existence of rationality in life within the environment of a dead or inert matter or nature. And also it is useful, she thinks, not only for suggesting practical solutions to environmental problems, but also because it can give us a more realistic view of ourselves beyond this narrow atomistic uh, 17th century image of social life, uh, which grounds today's crude and arid individualism. Of course, I cannot go into more detail um, here about this, but what I want to, to note is that Midgley offers the Gaia hypothesis neither as a gratuitous semi-mystical fantasy nor as a metaphysical construction. So what is clear, if, even if one disagrees with it, uh, with all of it or its details, is that the Gaia hypothesis is entirely naturalistic at least in the ontological terms um, of the entities and the processes that are being postulated. However, Midgley notes that the imaginative vision behind it, the idea of our planet as in some sense a single organism is of course very old. 
Plato um, called the earth and sing a single great living creature. And this is, this language um, is a language that people in many uh, cultures would find natural. Of course, the claim should be slightly corrected because Plato um, called the cosmos or the universe, not the earth, uh, a single great living being. But the important thing here is that the platonic metaphysics sustaining this claim are quite different from the metaphysics underlying modern or contemporary science. So, Plotinus and, and Midgley, a piece of cake. What Midgley found attractive um, to Plot in Plotinus is this holistic way in which he, try, he tried to capture the nature of the self and the relation between self and not self evidenced in her work. In her own words, and here they are, Plotinus wanted to find a wider, more inclusive perspective, which could bring together both these aspects of life, showing a continuity between the physical and the spiritual. And as we saw, this is what, um, this is an ambition that animates Midgley philosophy. Now, during the interview with Merchant that I mentioned, she summarizes the Plotinian position of the human self, which she too adopted. And she says, his ideas were like this, that everything is concentric and in the middle there is, as it were, the one from which it all comes. The germs of this are in Plato, I think already, but Plotinus worked it out in detail and his psychology was often very shrewd, I thought. In order to talk about these things intelligently, you have to get there, if you see what I mean. And if each of us is composed of a sort of concentric cake, we habitually live in the outer layers, but it is possible for us to shift. And we circle, and we all do, to some extent, we can increase the lifting. So Midgley's studies of Plotinus um, at the formative stage of her intellectual development influenced the direction of her thought, even if the way she interpreted Plotinus was already shaped by her own um, pre-existing sort of interests. In a way, this may be how it is always, um, but despite the lack of uh, concrete output, as it were, the encounter between Plotinus and Midgley, um, and thus I ho hopefully our encounter with them today was quite fruitful and perhaps tasteful. <laughs> nice. So thank you very much. <laughs>